Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Today's talk will feature a conversation between Secretary Golf Cruz and Susan Cain, followed by a question and answer session. When you came in, you should have received um, a note card and pencil. If you haven't and are interested in submitting a question, please raise your hand and let an usher know. Um, feel free to write down questions in the first half of this event and pass them to the aisles so the ushers can grab them um, so that we can answer some of those questions later on in the event. It is now my pleasure to introduce Secretary and Vice President for Student Life, Kimberly Goff Cruz. Secretary Goff Cruz is a graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School. After several years in private law practice, Ms. Goff Cruz returned to Yale as Assistant Dean in Yale College and Director of the Afro-American Cultural Center. She then went on to serve in various roles at Lellesley University, Wellesley College, and the University of Chicago. In 2012, she returned to Yale as Secretary and Vice President for Student Life. As she supports institutional governance, oversees official university functions, and provides strategic direction to improve the student experience, her goal is to help keep Yale at the forefront of education. It is my pleasure to introduce Secretary Goff Cruz. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. So it's great to see all of you in the audience today. Um, and to welcome our guest, Susan Kane, who just drove in from the Hudson River Valley. So we're really grateful for your, your travel here. Um, this event, just so you know, is part of the Vulnerability and Leadership Series, where we invite leaders from all sectors of society to talk about leadership, aspects of leadership, self-development, resiliency, and obviously vulnerability. The series is co-sponsored by the Yale Well Initiative, which was formerly called the Wellness Project. And that initiative was created in response to your request, students' requests, to have resources, training, and conversations about what it means to be a whole human being, not just the person who's studying, but someone who's doing all the other things that you do, and how to do that well. Today's conversation is going to focus on the ways in which introverts can thrive in communities like Yale and beyond it and how introverts can participate in the classroom, in the lab, in the studio, how they can run or student organizations, how they can have successful jobs and lives. Our conversation is for those of you who are introverts, both of us are introverts, it's for extroverts, and all of people who work with them, so it's for students, faculty, and staff. And we are honored to have Susan Kane, who is dubbed the fairy godmother of introverts. <laughs> all right? She is the New York Times best-selling author of Quiet, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. And she has a record-smashing TED Talk that has been viewed 17 million times. So she, I think you're in the top 20 at this point. Her second book is called Quiet Power, The Secret Strength of Introverts. And it's adapted from her first book, but it does focus on kids and teenagers and how they can thrive as introverts in school, in extracurricular activities, family life, and friendships. She is the leader of a revolution, the co-founder of the Quiet Revolution, in fact, the Quiet Schools Network and the Quiet Leadership Institute. She has been writing, and her writings can be seen in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, and she has numerous awards. She graduated from Princeton, that's the only downside. Um, Harvard Law School, okay. Um, <laughs> But she does live, as I said, in the, in the Hudson River Valley with her husband and her two sons. So we are delighted that she made the trip to join us to talk about yeah. introverts and how best to thrive. Welcome. Oh, welcome. So Susan, I thought I, we would start with a conversation about what exactly is an introvert. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading your Twitter feed, which you have phenomenal things coming out almost every day. And a couple of days ago, you had um, an ad from the Ris Whiskey River, River Soap Company that makes soap um, and has irreverent labels. And they make soap for foodies, for um, you know, cool kids, and they happen to make a soap for introverts. And here's what they said, people suck. That's why oh you prefer, you introverts, prefer to stay inside with your stuffed animal collection. But even enjoying your own company requires some ambience and some basic hygiene. So wash up with Soap for Introverts, a handcrafted bar dyed with a blend of non-confrontational ocean blues. And we didn't bother sending it because seriously, it's not like you're going to go anywhere. So that's, the, so that's some people's view of what it means to be an introvert. But is that actually true? What is your definition of an introvert? Yeah, you know, and it's funny that we're starting with that. Well, wait, first of all, I just want to say hi to all of you. It's so <laughs> nice to be here. And um, 
Notwithstanding your quip about Princeton, I really love Yale, as everyone who knows me knows. My sister went here and was in Saybrook College, and I've just always loved this place. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so I actually had great mixed feelings about posting that so bad, um, especially because of what you began with, the idea that people suck, yes. um, which I think is actually the great myth of what introverts are, you know, people who think that other people suck. And I don't think that's true at all. Um, we actually know, you know, if you look at personality psychology, there's no correlation between in introversion, extroversion versus how warm and loving or agreeable you are. Th those two things are distinct. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's more that introverts like to socialize in a very different way, um, preferring to focus their energies on one or two people at a time and to really go deep socially. Mm -hmm. But like really, the definition is more about what's happening neurobiologically, because um, introverts have nervous systems that just react more to stimulation uh, all kind of, it could be social stimulation, but it could also be lights and noise and just stuff going on in your lives. And um, if you're someone who reacts more to stimulation, that means that you feel at your most alive and calm when you're in quieter settings and you feel a little bit jangled when, when things ramp up mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but I, I, I do think that what happens is we all from such an early age are taught to adapt to a more extroverted culture that we lose sight of how we actually prefer to spend our own time. So I think if you wanted to figure out in two seconds where you fit on this introvert extrovert spectrum, the real question to ask yourself is imagine that you have a weekend or maybe even a week to spend exactly as you please with zero social or academic or whatever obligations, how would you spend that time and how many people would you spend it with if you're really giving yourself that permission? And I think that gives you your true north. Great. And you talk a little bit about the fact that the, the um, culture around the U.S. culture, I think, about how people think about introversion has shifted over time. Can you say a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was really curious when I first started researching this book whether this cultural bias mm -hmm. that I, I had, I, you know, knew we were all living with, um, whether, it, whether it was something that was intrinsic and innate to any culture. Um, so I thought, okay, well, the first thing to do is look at has U.S. culture always been this way and our cultures across the world this way? Or are we, you know, is this kind of the way it has to be? Um, so when I looked at the U.S., what I found is that cultural historians say we used to live in a culture of character. This was back in the 19th century. And this was a time when people were living in smaller towns alongside people they had known all their lives. So the qualities that mattered were kind of more inward and deep qualities, like do you have character and do you take care of the people around you? You know, because you get to know over time which neighbors do and which ones don't. Um, but then in the 20th century, with the rise of cities and industrialization, we all started moving into these great population centers where you're living now alongside strangers and you're working in corporations often. And what started to matter was these qualities of do you have magnetism and you know, can you dazzle somebody the minute you meet them as opposed to what unfolds over the course mm -hmm. of your life together. And um, so that's when we moved into this culture of personality. And do you, do you see a difference in terms of how introversion plays out for women and men and how people value introversion in women and men? That's an interesting question because the, um, the, the number of female and male introverts mm -hmm. is the same. I mean, according to recent studies, it's about 50% for each. Okay. For each. Um, how but, many actually do you think are, exist? I mean, is, there, is it half the population who are introverts? Or, how many do That's we... what the most recent studies show. And then older studies found about a third were introverts. Okay. So I figure either way, you know, we're talking one out of every two or three people. Okay, so you're saying a third to a half were introverts in yeah. the U.S. And then of that, it's mostly, it's half and half male and female. Of, of that, there's no difference really okay. um, for male or female. But I, I think what is different is just the way it plays out based okay. on social expectations, right? Because right? for women, you know, it's both easier and harder at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, for women, I think there is more cultural license to be uh, just quiet and hanging back, and I, uh, you know that that derives from 
all kinds of problematic right. um, constraints that women have been operating under, mm -hmm. but in this one case, it gives you a little more latitude. On the other hand, women have historically been expected to play the role of kind of the vivacious host person. Right. Um, and then for men, you know, male introverts do automatically have the authority that is accorded to males in our culture, but at the same time, the pressure for male introverts is um, the, the, the pressure to be kind of the dominant and take charge person. And uh, like, these are obviously stereotypes and they mm -hmm. play out in all different ways, but these are some of the kind of trends that I, I hear about from people. And so do you, are there other cultures across the world that value introversion differently? You found that were more positive in terms of how they thought about introverts? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the ones that spring to mind the, the quickest, it, mm -hmm. it kind of varies from culture to culture, but right. Finland is, is known to be a much quieter society. And then I, I actually spent a whole chapter of the book looking at Confucian-based societies, yes. which, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really interesting there because, you know, there, there's much more of, sorry, I've got like hair in my, coming out of my microphone. Um, you have in Confucian-based societies much more of the idea of, of group orientation and that no one person should stand out too much from the group. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to be quieter and there's more, a, a, a sense of, of strength being found in silence. Um, so like I always think of this one, I, I did a ton of interviews uh, for this chapter. And mm -hmm. There's one I always think of from a, a woman I met who had come to this country from Shanghai and she was biologically, I would say, one of the more extroverted people I've ever met. You know, she was just like this very jolly, outgoing person by nature. Um, but she talked about how when she first came here, and she was in school, I think it may have been grad school at the time, she was absolutely shocked to find these cultural norms where, you know, the way she put it was like, the students are expected to talk nonsense. <laughs> that was what she said, like you raise your hand and talk nonsense. And then the teachers nod respectfully at you and encourage you to speak more nonsense. And, and, you know, and from her point of view, that's like wasting everybody's time. Why would you ever do that? Right. Um, so, yeah. So let's move to the classroom, why don't we? And talk about introverts in the classroom and, and what, um, what, how they might thrive in the classroom. I remember in your book, um, I think it was in the secrets, the second book, there was a cartoon of a student who has a bubble saying, don't call on me, don't call on me, don't call on me. I don't know yeah. if all of you have had those, that kind of experience, like, please don't call on me. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the, the kinds of things you think work for, for, for an introverted student? Yeah, um, I think, well, I'll, I'll give you one tip, and, and you'll, you'll get this as a fellow law person. Um, I discovered this kind of accidentally when I was in law school, and, you know, you... In, in law school, classes are conducted in these giant amphitheaters with the Socratic method, and the professor just calls on you in front of hundreds of people. And I really wanted, when I first got there, I really wanted to avoid just being called on in, in that kind of a so way. I. So I forced myself, like on the first or second day of class, to raise my hand and just say something, anything, because I, I reasoned that then the professor would be less likely to cold call me. And, um, and not only did it work in, in terms of avoiding the cold calling, but I found it had this other incredible unexpected byproduct, which was that after that, the professor started directing comments to me and would like, refer back to things I had said early on. Um, How and did others, you feel about that? I actually really liked okay. it. You know, I, I felt like, oh, I, I actually contributed something to this class, and, and that felt really good. You know, and other students after class, would re we'd be talking about class, and they would refer to, to that kind of thing. Um, so I, I discovered through this, and now I work with a lot of people in workplaces, mm -hmm. and I often advise them in meetings to do the same thing of, of thinking in advance something you might want to contribute or, or a question you want to raise and giving yourself a push to ask it early because what happens then is that you emotionally, when you do that, become a center in the room and other people are directing energy towards you. And if you wait too long to speak, you feel emotionally ever further to the margins and it becomes harder and harder to feel like you actually have a place there. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of subtle shifts make a really big difference. Now, if you're a faculty member or you're running a meeting perhaps yeah. and you recognize that someone might be introverted, what would you say we should do in that situation? Well, I mean, a few things. What one is, especially if there's an area where you know that that person mm -hmm. might have a lot to contribute, 
Mm -hmm. You might want to let them know in advance. You know, we're going to be talking about X, Y, Z today, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I know you've got a lot to say. Mm -hmm. um, or you could use other techniques like uh, going around the room and having everybody contribute. Because a, a lot of what we're talking about, whether it's biological introversion or cultural introversion or gender, you know, all these different things are at play. Um, some people feel like they have a lot more permission to speak than others do, just on some deep down level. And so you want to create structures where the people who feel they have less permission are handed the permission and invited to speak. Um, and, and so another thing you could do is say, okay, we've got, everybody seems to be going um, in the direction of opinion X. Can we have somebody take the, the devil's advocate position of opinion Y? And I just want you to argue that position. And then you're giving someone the, the permission to go against the grain without necessarily having to own it at that moment, but they're just invited to take that role. So it sounds like you're talking about a difference between, or you see a difference between class participation and class engagement. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I don't know. I mean, all those things, I think, have more to do with participation okay. in a way. Class engagement, I think, is it's an important thing to think about because I, I think we do tend to think too much that class participation mm -hmm. means, you know, going like this or, or, right. or speaking out. And in fact, for a lot of people, they're engaging deeply with the material by reading okay. and taking notes about it or, you know, by talking with a classmate after class. And for them, that engagement is just as profound, even though it's harder to track from the professor's point of view. Okay. Uh, you, you use this interesting phrase called passing as an extrovert, yeah. which is a very, you know, I don't know if anybody has felt that, but can you talk about that phenomenon and give us some examples of what that might look like? Yeah, I mean, I hear about this from people <laughs> all the time. I, I, okay, so I first became a, well, no, I guess I, I've always known this, but I became aware of the extent of this phenomenon of basically introverts pretending to be more extroverted than they really were. Um, my book came out and then I gave a TED talk about it just a few weeks later. And the audience at TED, you know, it's, I don't know how many people, 1,500 or something. And, um, and it's this audience of these huge movers and shakers. And I came off the stage and, and I was one of the first speakers and then I was there all week. And for the whole rest of that week, I literally, I, I could barely even walk an inch across the room because everybody was coming up to me and telling me, that's my story too. Um, and don't tell, some, some would literally say, don't tell anyone, but that's who I really am. Or some would say, you know, I, I've never told anyone before, but now I'm going to. Um, and, and this has kept happening to me. So I, I did, I, I sat once on a panel and the other panelists were, um, it was Ariana Huffington, George Stephanopoulos, Candace Bergen, and I'm forgetting some of the others, but they were anchor people on TV. And one by one, they all said, yeah, I'm an introvert, I'm an introvert, I'm an introvert. And it's just like the, the extent to which people don't talk about how they really feel and what their true social preferences mm -hmm. are, it's, it's, it's so enormous that I can't even put it into words. Is this why you created the, the Quiet Revolution Foundation, or your institute rather, in, yeah. in Harlem? And so can you talk a little bit more about that, what you hope to accomplish? And why did you start on just work and school? I mean, you really had to, you said you had to narrow it and you wanted to work in those two areas. Yeah, I mean, well, the focus is on work and school because I think those are the mm -hmm. places where people spend the most of their time, mm -hmm. right? You know, kids sure. are there all day, grown-ups are at work all day. Um, and. And these are the social structures that I think have the most profound impact on our lives. True, true. We have a number of students here who are um, student leaders. So I want to s yeah. switch a little bit to, to, to how, how you think of a quiet leader mm -hmm. and, uh, in a way that uh, might be supportive for student organizations here. Can you yeah. talk about what you see as effective quiet leadership? Yeah, I mean, it looks, it, it, it looks like so many different things, but I'm going to start actually by giving you a statistic, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of these statistics now. But I, I, I do believe that when most people think of what a good leader is or a natural leader is, they're assuming, whether consciously or not, they're assuming that it's somebody very charismatic and outspoken and type A and you know, mm -hmm. the, all that. And um, in fact, there was this one study where a, a guy named Jim Collins went out and, mm -hmm. and, and looked at the the 11 best performing companies in the country. And he wanted to figure out what set these companies apart from the rest of the more mediocre pack. 
And he found that every single one of these companies was led by a CEO who had two characteristics. The first one was having a fierce sense of will and dedication. Like they really cared about the company. And then the second characteristic was that these, each of these CEOs was described by their peers as being um, quiet, unassuming, low-key, soft-spoken, and even shy. And you know that, That's that, not what we would normally think. It's not what you would normally think. And it might at first seem so counterintuitive. You'd be like, how, how can, what could mm -hmm. explain this? But if you study introverts the way I do, it's not that <laughs> surprising because what happens is, and for those of you who are introverts, you know this, we tend to get really passionate about one or two areas in our lives and to like really go deep into mm -hmm. those passions. And so in the service of your passions, you will end up acquiring all kinds of expertise and building your networks as you get to know other people who have the same passion and you start inspiring trust in people. So you start seeing all these leaders who ascend to these roles, not because they were the kinds of kids who just like had a, a will to lead, because some children are like that, you mm -hmm. know, and they're like that all their lives. So they're not those people. They just like really care about this thing. And in the name of this thing, they become a great leader. And, and all of these CEOs were like that. And, and there's so many. I, I mean, so Gandhi is another great example who, um, Gandhi was so shy when he was a kid at school, he used to run home from school as soon as the bell rang because he didn't want to have to socialize with his classmates. And if you look at his autobiography, he talks about for all his life being really uncomfortable in group settings and not liking to be the one running meetings or holding forth. And those qualities of, of effortlessly you know, bringing together a group, it, it is an amazing asset to leadership. I don't want to mm -hmm. pretend that it's not. What I do want to say is that there are so many different pathways to fulfilling these roles. And somebody like a Gandhi, who just cared so deeply and everybody knew it, ends up attracting the other people who care about that same thing with the same authentic depth. And you end up building a movement that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what leader, quiet leadership often looks like. You know, it looks like, like a really deep commitment. And you talk also about the fact that quiet leaders often have a partner who yes. offsets yeah. or complements part of what. Can you talk yeah. a little about that and give us some, some examples? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think this is true for all areas of mm -hmm. life that, you know, no one human being is, is good at everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so the more honest you can be with yourself about what your strengths are and what your gaps are, the more you can surround yourself with people who you love who also offset those gaps. Um, so, for example, at Facebook, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO, he's a very introverted guy, everybody says. And um, he brought Sheryl Sandberg in as his COO, partly because, you know, she's super talented, and also because she's a very strong extrovert. And so for her, it's very natural, and she likes to spend time building relationships with advertisers and that kind of thing. And he likes to spend time poring over uh, analysis and that kind of thing. Not to say each one can't do the other, and it's not to say each one doesn't sometimes have to stretch outside their comfort zone to do the other, but you're so much more effective if you can just have someone else doing that. So like to me, yin and yang is the answer to everything. In, in all ways. You know, let me go back to the, de the question of definitions because I'm not sure I really yeah. understand the difference between being an introvert, being quiet, and being shy. Yeah. Is there, I yeah. think there's a range, but I'm not quite, can you talk a little no, about that? No, that's a really good question. Right. Um, Cause introversion is much more about how you react to okay. stimulation. So, you know, you just kind of prefer settings where there's less stuff coming at you. Um, and shyness is more about the fear of social judgment. So if you're a shy person, and let's say you're looking at someone's face and they have a neutral expression on their face, you will tend to read disapproval into the neutral expression. And that disapproval will wound you more than it would for a less shy person. Um, and this tends to come out in, especially in settings where social judgment is woven into the experience, like a job interview or going on a date or public speaking mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so in terms of the work that we've been doing at Quiet Revolution and in my book and so on, um, we're really looking at both. It's, it's about introversion and about shyness. But important to know that 
it's not a complete overlap. So you could be an introvert who's not shy at all. And I believe President Obama is probably an example of this. Uh, I think he's quite introverted and really not anxious in any way, socially or otherwise. Um, and then you can be a shy extrovert, like the, the singer Barbara Streisand, who everyone says has a very larger than life personality, but she stopped performing for decades because her stage fright was so intense. So these things are pretty complicated. Let's go back to um, now t talking about uh, students and I'm thinking about social environment and social mm -hmm. things like parties and networking and all those kind of things. And yeah. that can be really difficult for somebody who's introverted. Can you talk a little bit about how we might navigate that successfully? And so one, on the one hand, and then how if you're, if you're hosting a party or a social networking event, how you might organize that so that it makes it easier for people to function. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I would go back to is um, the idea of constantly asking yourself, like, if I truly were spending my time the way I prefer to spend it, what would I be doing right now? Because, you know, you, you all are living at a stage of your li lives where there's tremendous pressure to be going to parties all the time. And maybe you enjoy that and maybe you don't. And if you don't, it's okay. I mean, especially on a campus like this, there's a thousand ways of connecting with people and getting to know your classmates that don't involve going to a big keg party or whatever it is. So, like, do it some of the time, but you probably don't have to go as much as you're thinking that you do, number one. Um, and I would look for the alternative ways, like maybe you'd rather get together in a small group with other people who share the same interest and, 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 and connect that way. <laughs> um, but when you are going to parties, and especially if you're having those moments of discomfort, what can really, there, there's two mental tricks that help. One is to think of yourself as the host and make it your role to make the people around you feel comfortable um, so that you start taking your mental energy away from your own discomfort and towards everyone else's. Mm -hmm. And you can assume that at least half the people there have way more discomfort than they're trying to express. Um, and then the other thing is to make it a kind of intellectual puzzle of just knowing, I mean, you, you know this, everybody has something absolutely fascinating about them. And so if your job when you're meeting somebody is to figure out, like to tap into your curiosity and figure out what is the thing that's really fascinating here, that can make it really interesting and you might develop real connections that way. Great. Um, I want to go a little bit back to, to leadership because you now are running this organization mm -hmm. um, and you're still writing and I wonder if you could talk about vulnerability and leadership, which is the theme of our, of our series. In what ways have you seen yourself be vulnerable as a, as a leader and, and how have you uh, adapted to that, if yeah, at all? Yeah, vulnerability. Really, think, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's at the core of everything, yeah. really. And I, you know, I, I think you had asked me the question of like, um, is it easier to be vulnerable on the page or in real life? Yes. And mm -hmm. it's much easier to be vulnerable on the page, I Why? believe. Why? Um, I think you don't have to look at the people who are reading about your vulnerable thing mm -hmm. as you're talking about it. Um, but it's really complicated. We're living in this world where, although it's now become fashionable to talk about words like vulnerability, well, let me say it differently. I, I think there is a balance that we're all constantly striking mm -hmm. between having to think about self-presentation, which is a fact of life, and having to think about being really, or not think about it, but wanting to be really sincere with the people around you. And you can't be sincere without being vulnerable. It's impossible because every single one of you has some kind of deep ache at the center of your being because you're human. I mean, there, whether you're religious or not, every single religious tradition is, is premised on this idea. You know, Adam and Eve thrown out of the Garden of Eden. The garden's gone. Um, you know, Buddha leaves his father's palace and discovers that actually life is dissatisfaction and suffering and, and then figures out what to do about it. This is a human truth. And it's, it's so weird to me that we live with this human truth mm -hmm. and yet we're usually not allowed to talk about it most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so like all this talk about you know, like going on Facebook and, and people will say, well, it, it, it can be very fake um, and overly curated. And I think that what people are really reacting to is not so much 
the status anxiety that Facebook induces in people, but it's just really grating that, people, that no one's telling the truth. I, I think we all want the truth. So, um, so, so can you give us an example of when you've been vulnerable and how, that has, how you've uh, dealt with it? Yeah, it okay, so, yeah, coming, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sure there's so plenty, but. Okay. I, I, I think one of, there are a few reasons, but one of the reasons it took me a while to become a writer, even though that was what I had always wanted mm -hmm. to do, is that I like writing about the vulnerable stuff. I, I like writing about, like, telling the truth about what it's like to be alive right. and the hard things. And so, it was really Im uncomfortable for me and embarrassing at the beginning to write a book about being an introvert. You know, and during the, like now, okay, now everybody's talking about it a right. little bit more, so it's okay, but during the years that I was writing the book and it hadn't come it out yet. It took what, seven years, I think you said to yeah, write it? Yeah, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I was working on it for seven years and I remember going to dinner parties and saying, yeah, I'm writing this book about introversion and people would be like, what? You know, like it, it seemed like a weird topic at the mm -hmm. time um, and it felt like a stigmatized topic. So, I, I just had to finally decide, okay, I'm just going to deal with that and that's the price that I'm going to pay in order to tell the truth about what I think. So that, um, that your, your but, writing was your act of vulnerability and putting yeah, it in publishing. And then, yeah, so first the writing was, then once I had the book contract and I was working on the book, I was like, okay, I'm okay with that, but now I have to go up on stage and talk about it, you know, and that was a whole other thing that was way harder at the beginning. Now I'm really used to it, but... <laughs> I walked around for the first few months after the book was published and doing all the publicity stuff that you have to do. Um, you know, I, I just felt incredibly raw and exposed. And, but I will say, the good news is, you get over those feelings. Like the How more, did you get over them? Well, it's just, um, the more you're exposed to things mm -hmm. that are uncomfortable, the more you become desensitized to them. Like people have studied this phenomenon. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and the key, for anything that you're feeling uncomfortable about, whether it's sort of generic public speaking or about being specifically vulnerable, um, the key is to expose yourself to the thing that's making you so uncomfortable in very small and bite-sized ways. Um, so, like for me, I actually went to a class for people who were uncomfortable with public speaking. And the very first session of the class, like all we had to do was stand up, say our names, and sit back down again and declare victory. Um, you know, and then you'd go back the next week and, and all you'd have to do is stand up and a answer a few questions about yourself, like where you'd been to school and where you grew up, declare victory, sit back down. And you kind of ratchet it up little by little from there. And the miracle of it is that that process just somehow works and it, it, it can really all melt away. Right. You know, you, there was a New York Times op-ed that you did, I think it was in March of yeah. this year. And it's, it's the corollaries to having conversations about leaders, but talking about followers. And I wanted to, to read to you what, mm -hmm. um, a little bit about what you wrote, just yeah. ask you about it. Um, because it, it, in a way you argue that college campuses need to really create more followers, not leaders. That was sort of the theme, I mm. believe, of the, of the, of the op-ed. And you said, if college admissions offices show us whom and what we value, then we seem to think that the ideal society is composed of type A's. This is perhaps unsurprising, even if these examples come from the highly competitive institutions. It's part of the American DNA to celebrate those who rise above the crowd. And in recent decades, the meteoric path to leadership of youthful, of youthful garage and dorm dwellers, from Steve Jobs to Mark Zuckerberg, has made King of the Hill status seem possible for every 19-year-old. So now we have high school students vying to be presidents of as many clubs as they can. It's no longer enough to be a member of the student council. Now you have to run the school. Yet a well-functioning student body, not to mention polity, also needs followers. It needs team players, and it needs those who go their own way. It, need, it needs leaders who are called to service rather than to status. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty powerful statement. So could you talk a little bit more about that? And yeah, I, I mean, okay, so I was horrified by this even back when I was applying to schools, and I'm <laughs> even more horrified now um, by the pressure that all of you are under from a very young age, I mean, you had to have felt it to get here, the, the pressure to be the leader of this and to be the leader of that. And I'm, as you can tell from what I said before, I'm all for being the leader of something that you truly care about, like you should do that. But it just, it seems to me that in the culture now there's this, there's a kind of emptiness in the pressure to just be the leader of something for its own sake. And, um, and I believe that you can have 
a life full of great contribution to the people around you and full of great personal happiness and fulfilling without being the leader of a damn thing. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you could go and do great science or great art or be a great parent or, you know, any, any number of things that have nothing to do with conventional notions of leadership. So, it, yeah. What's been the response to that statement? Uh, an enormous amount of interest, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard from a lot of universities um, who were interested Interesting. in exploring oh, yeah. the topic. Yeah, I, like, I, in fairness to university admissions, I think that most admissions offices know that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, they're inundated with all these applications and how on earth do you distinguish right. one from another? Um, but I just wish we could expand the way we think about what it means to be human. Yeah. One of the things you talk about is um, the importance of space. I think you call them nurturing niche, niche, niche. I think I forgot exactly what you call them, but you, you, oh, restorative niche, restorative, mm -hmm. thank you, restorative mm -hmm. niches. Yeah. And we are we are building. We've just built two new colleges, two new residential colleges. We've um, we are building a new campus center. Um, we are we are always looking for space on campus. And yeah. you talk about the need for introverts to be in not just large spaces like this, but small spaces in and also what it's like to be in a dorm space and how to function mm -hmm. if you're in those small spaces. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit and give people advice about how they might navigate that and how we might actually want to think about building our buildings? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so what I'm about to say, it's true for everyone. It's kind of more true for introverts, but really all mm -hmm. humans need to be in physical spaces where you have spaces to come together and you also have spaces that mm -hmm. you can come, where, where you can be by yourself. Um, so, you know, I don't know how much you guys have been exposed to it, but in corporate America now, or really globally, the trend in office design, it's these gigantic open plan offices where people don't really get that much personal space. And when I was first uh, researching my book and I started talking to people in these offices, they were all coming up to me and kind of whispering and saying, you know, I. I I'm really unhappy in this office, but I can't, I can't say this to my boss because I'll be perceived as mm -hmm. not being a team player. Mm -hmm. and, and they would say, is there any research out there that I could show my boss to just prove to them why they shouldn't be designing the next uh, space that we're moving to like that? And I started looking, and I found that there's this mountain of data that's out there. And again, this data is not even about introverts. It's mm. just about humans. That, like, if, if you're in a space where you have no privacy and um, you feel like you're subject to people's gaze and people's uh, evaluation all the time. It, it increases pressure, it increases cognitive load. Um, you get interrupted more, so it takes you more time to do things. Mm -hmm. And you get sick more often. And then the, the weird real paradox is you actually don't form as many social bonds or, or close ones. Because if you think about it, the, the currency of forming a true friendship is often that you're sharing information with your friend that you wouldn't be sharing to everybody in your dorm or office. And if you can never be alone in order to do that, that's just not going to be happening as often. So in terms of how to build university spaces, my suggestion is um, to design them so that you've got the open spaces here, but you've got plenty of nooks and crannies where people can go to be by themselves or to be in little dyads. Um, you know, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, I remember this even from when I was an undergrad at Princeton and the dining hall that I went to in my residential college, it was a modern one and it was designed so that it had all the, the big tables were in the center and then you had a few tables that were meant for just two or three or two or three people at a time. And the, they were off on the sides, but in, in kind of in the cobwebby sides. You, you felt like those were the dusty, um, <laughs> undesirable tables at which to sit. And I remember even then feeling this conflict and feeling like, gosh, I'd really rather be sitting at one of those tables with one or two friends having a real conversation. But there was so much social pressure that was built right into the design um, to be sitting at the big tables where people were recounting their drinking games from the weekend before. And, and, and yeah, so the physical space really makes a difference. Makes a difference. Yeah. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, and so we have questions from the audience. I'm going to turn our attention to those. And our first question is, what advice can you give to introverts who want to uh, stand out and take leadership positions, but sometimes feel overshadowed by the extroverted peers? 
Yeah, um, I mean, the best thing that you can do, really, well, it's a couple things. One is to develop mastery and expertise in whatever the area is where you want to be a leader. Because, first of all, the more mastery you have, the more confidence you're going to have. And you're going to be expressing that confidence in all kinds of ways you're not even aware of. Um, and other people will be reacting to it too. So it, it will all just kind of happen more naturally. And, um, and then the other thing is to come back to what we said before of just give yourself pushes. If it's something that really matters to you, give yourself a push to speak at the moments that you might be kind of afraid to do it. Um, or do it in the beginning. Or and do it, it at easier. the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, one rule of thumb that I often give to people is to ask yourself, am I not speaking or am I not doing X, Y, Z out of fear or just out of true preference? And if it's out of fear, don't, don't let the fear be your master. Um, you know, blow past the fear. But if it's out of a true preference of this is actually what I'd rather be doing, then honor that. Our next question is, how does introversion change, introversion change over the course of a lifetime mm -hmm. or through different yeah. stages of life? Yeah, so this is complicated because um, the data shows that for all of us, over time, we get more introverted. And really? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, haven't you noticed that? Because I, I feel like I have with my friends that all I my friends have mellowed out I'm more selective. I'm sorry? I have to say I'm more selective. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more introverted, okay. but okay. But okay. Yeah, but okay. I, so, so people mellow out. I mm. think it's probably because their nervous systems, all of mm. them, become more reactive to stimulation as you mm. get older. So people see quiet more. But on the other hand, what happens is we all develop so many skills as we grow older that things that would have, for introverts, let's say, things that would have bothered us when we were younger may become less of a big deal as we get older, you know, such as public speaking. Like if you have a fear of that, for example, you might really overcome it. And so you're going to start seeming and acting like more of an extrovert as you grow older and get those skills, but your underlying being probably won't change and might even get quieter. Great. We talked a little bit about spaces, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, but the question now is how do you make time to be alone or recharge mm -hmm. when you live in a university environment? Yeah. Small dorm rooms, I think is what the... Yeah. Um, so if you're living in this kind of an environment, you have to really prioritize it, and that is the only way it's going to happen. Um, you have to make it a commitment that you honor as fiercely as the commitment to study for your midterms. Um, and what does so, that look like? What does that and mean? And what does it look like? I don't know. I mean, it, for you, it might be uh, taking a walk, like mm -hmm. just taking a walk around this campus. There's people all around you, but you can walk quite undisturbed, I think. Uh, I'm sure there are some pathways mm -hmm. where you can. Um, for some people, it's going to be exercise. Y you have to kind of figure out what your thing is. But in my experience, the hurdle is not so much figuring out the space as it is feeling emotionally entitled to actually do it. Because what you're going to be feeling is like, I shouldn't be doing this. There's something wrong with my need to do it. Um, I'm too busy to do it. But you just have to tell yourself you're going to be so much more socially present and academically on your game if you give yourself those moments than if you don't. How can we help as administrators and faculty? In, in getting that message out, what, what would you suggest that we do? I would, well, first of all, I would talk about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, a lot of the issue here is just kind of normalizing this discourse and making it part of everyday conversation. Um, I would ask to, for people who you think are influential role models mm -hmm. on campus, whether they're professors or students or whatever, mm -hmm. um, who are introverts, to have discussions like this one mm -hmm. where they talk about what their strengths are as introverts, um, what their challenges have been, so it just becomes part of the everyday language. Um, and when you're, when you're creating programs, like an orientation program, let's mm -hmm. say, you know, make sure to build in quiet space and breaks for people and have the people who are leading the programs honor it. Not just honor it like, oh, we, we know you introverts need it, but just like <laughs> um, in a more, like everybody needs this kind of way. Right. So now it's time, now we're gonna have our quiet space because we all need that. You know, call it meditation if you need to because that's a, a fashionable Popular. way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Popular. Okay, should we categorize introverts and extroverts or think of introversion as a spectrum? Oh, thank you for asking that, whoever that came from. We should think of it as a spectrum, for sure. 
Um, so Carl Jung, the psychologist who first popularized these terms in the 1920s, um, even he said, no such thing as pure introvert or pure extrovert. He said, such a man would be in a lunatic asylum. That was his quote. <laughs> um, and so we all will have a tendency to be at one part of the spectrum or another, but we're also all much more complex than that. And I'm sure you've had the experience, um, if you're extroverts, of feeling like, oh, now I'm really seeking quiet time, or if you're introverts, feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, when I'm around these people and talking about this subject, I feel like really out there. Um, so that's, that's, that's all part of it. So I know that you, you um, some people have said that you are fo so focused on introverts that you are, must be anti-extrovert, but I don't mm. think that that's true. Yeah. I, I know you happen yeah. to be married to an intro extrovert. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to actually um, ask you to talk to the extroverts in the room about yeah. what, you know, you know, what they can do to support the introverts in their myths. Yeah. Um, like if I ask your husband what he does for you, what would he say? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, and it's also what I do for him because it's both. Right. I, like we, we actually both need to make all kinds of adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for my husband it would be, it's probably things like, you know, the advice that I just gave to all of you, I very often will say to him at around 7 p.m., like, I really want to go for a walk right now you know, and I'll go and take a quiet walk. And he's not saying, you know, I really wish you'd make dinner or can I come with you on the walk? Like he knows I just need the walk. And, and we build those kinds of things mm -hmm. in. Um, and then there's things that, uh, adjustments that I always have to remember to make for him. And I'll give you an example of one. He has a really lovely, delightful way of getting excited and enthusiastic about stuff, he gets very, very exuberant, and it's really nice to be around. Um, and so when my book first hit the bestseller list, he was like jumping up and down and ululating <laughs> and, and um, you know, planning a party within the first five minutes. Um, and it was my book, so I was just as excited, but my way of expressing it is, is much more muted. You know, I, I'm more like, this is really great. Um, so, so that's fine and I'm really benefiting from his wonderful exuberance when I'm around him but what I always have to remember is when something great happens for him or for our family in general I have to give myself a push to express it in a more outward way mm. so that he feels like he's getting that affirmation back from me um, and of course he at the same time needs to remember that it's never going to look the way, look to him the way he would express it, but, but giving myself that push can really go a long way. Um, so that's kind of why I was saying before right. about why it's so important to make this part of everyday discourse, because there's so many misunderstandings that can happen between friends and couples and colleagues of the kind that I was just describing. Like you might think that someone doesn't care when they really do care, um, but they just are more muted about it. And, and talking about that and making those tweaks for each other can go such a long way. Great. Well, I think we might be almost at the end of our time if I'm looking at it. Um, so, and I want to give some time for, for her to leave um, on time and for you to come up and ask questions individually if you'd like to, since we try to be supportive of our, of our introverts. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll have Stephen come up and close out the, the session and um, give you some sense of how we're going to move forward. Um, but as he's doing this, I'd love to, again, thank you very much for, for making time to come talk sure. to us. We love to see the fairy godmother for, uh, <laughs> for introverts, and we'd love to have you back on campus as, as soon as possible, if possible. So thank you so much for all your advice. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs>
Thank you so much, and thanks to Stephen and to Kim for doing this. All right, Stephen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Susan, and taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be here. Um, also, thank you, Secretary Goff Cruz, um, for hosting this conversation and really working with Yale Well to make sure wellness is an important part of the programming on campus. And also, thank you to Yale Well and Life Lab for sponsoring today's event. Um, the audience, thank you so much for being here and for your engagement and the insightful questions that you submitted. Um, if you have a lunch ticket, if you could please exit to the left when you're leaving and go out through Old Campus. Um, otherwise, if you could exit through the Elm Street door to the right. Thank you so much again for joining us And if you want to, today. just come on up for small conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.